he is risen indeed. Amen. And you may be seated, and we're going to have um, Stan. You can take your music. What's your living hope? What, what keeps you going in the morning? What gets you up and moving? What helps you deal with the tough stuff and the hard situations that, that come in your life? For people of faith, for Christian folks, on this day, uh, Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because that is what gives us hope. This was probably most true for the early followers of Jesus. In the end of Matthew 27, there's a story that's told of a, of a rich man, Joseph, who sees Jesus dying on the cross. And, and he goes and he asks the authorities, may I have his body and may he be buried in my, in my tomb? He goes and he gets the body in verse 20, 58 of t- chapter 27. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Jesus took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own, uh, his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and he went away. These two verses are going to come up uh, on the screen here, uh, Ma- uh, Matthew 27 and Matthew 28, verse 1. The people who were there with him was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. They were sitting opposite the tomb, and then we're going to the next chapter. We, we see that after the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. They had been there the night before. They woke up in the morning, and they're feeling devastated because of their loss. And they go back to the same place, and they are surprised. Uh, their sorrow turns to incredible joy because what they were anticipating, seeing their Lord in that tomb. He was gone. He was alive. And this is what gave them hope. This uh, week ago, Monday night, around 11.30 at night, my phone rings, and I know it, I should have turned it off. And it was a Facebook message from a friend of mine. His name is Paul. And he sent me this message. My heart came in. I'm at the hospital, all prepped and ready for 6 a.m. surgery. You don't get many texts like that, right? My heart came in. Some two years earlier, Paul uh, suffered a massive heart attack. Uh, His heart attack was so devastating, the left side of his heart pretty much never functioned again. He was brought to the hospital, and he said, Paul is a great storyteller, and I know he's probably watching online this morning and have permission to to share his story. Uh, he, He goes to the hospital. He's in a coma for like 30 days. He's transported by ambulance from one hospital to another, by helicopter another time. And he's sent off to a local community hospital, pretty much being let, let go to die. And he wakes up and he sees his wife, and she, Anne, is looking at him. And, and, and he says, where am I? In a hospital. He goes, who's sick? <laughs> and his wife tells him, you're sick, right? <laughs> Well, well, his heart attack was so devastating that his heart just didn't seem to function again. We're going to bring up a picture of him right now. He had the heart transplant, but getting there was, was quite, quite a journey. He was, they do a couple of tests to make sure a recipient can receive a heart. And uh, he failed that test not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. He, he failed it. When he sent me this text on um, a week ago, Monday night, uh, I wrote back to him right away. I said, uh, I'll be up and praying tomorrow morning for you. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace, and I thought I was being clever here, his peace will guard your hearts and, and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And Paul's response to me was really beautiful. He said this, Oh, I'm not worried at all. My my fleece was, Lord, if this is your will, please let it happen quickly. He was four weeks on the waiting list for a heart transplant. He goes, I'm praying for the grieving family of the donor. I wrote back to Paul. I said, Paul, you're a beautiful man. You know, I love you, Paul. He has such 
a, a tender compassion uh, for, for people. He, and he shared, he, we've talked about how his life changed. Paul was a contractor, a uh, carpenter. He was working on a family home, doing some repairs in their house. And uh, it was just before Christmas, maybe October, November, somewhere like that. And the family wanted their new kitchen in by Christmas. Uh, but they were uh, people of faith, and they were having a Bible study that was happening in their house. And he got to meet all these, he would say, strange people. Uh, but there was something about them that was just kind of remarkable. Paul was trying to uh, make, do this job so he could buy a furnace to heat the house that he was building. Money was tight. And he was there, and in doing the job, he saw these people come, and they said, can you work nights? He said, sure, because he wanted to make the money but we have this study that's happening on. And he said, they, they lured me in with cookies and tea. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he went to that meeting and he saw a guy named Jack sitting there in the Bible study. And Jack had the biggest Bible on his knee and he had big glasses. And Paul, this was his, his words, he looked like a doink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there was something about these folks. And he delayed the job so he could come back week after week. And a little while later, he writes to his girlfriend, Anne, and he says these words, I found it. He doesn't doesn't really know what it was, right? But it was this person of Jesus Christ. And he told me he was walking in a park, a local park in that area of Oakville, and uh, he came to faith. He gave his life to Jesus. And a week later, Anne did the same thing. But he's been now, he had this heart attack two years ago, just really not doing well. One doctor said to him, it described him as um, wasting and frail. So Paul called his left foot wasting and his right foot fail. <laughs> and he kept putting one in front of the other. And they put him a, on a pump about four months ago to help his heart. Pretty amazing, again, all these interventions that are, that are possible. But the pump helped things stabilize He passed that test for the heart transplant and he had the heart transplant and he's alive. But but he's like, keep on clapping. But he had incredible peace through the whole thing because of his encounter with Jesus. So again, I asked this morning, what's your living hope? If things like this happen in your life, how are you going to move ahead? Or how are you moving ahead through the the dead-end situations that we face? A dead-end job, a dead-end relationship, a dead-end marriage, a dead-end education. And it doesn't seem to be any hope at all. Well, the message of Jesus, as the the sermon title that we have today, is that we're resurrection people encountering the risen Christ. And when these ladies, the two Marys, Mary Magdalene and the other, went to the tomb and had this angelic uh, kind of encounter, it was a mind-blowing experience for them. And then Jesus himself spoke with them. Look at verses uh, 20, uh, Matthew 28, verses 5 to 7. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, now I have told you. And I think the next verse kind of captures what my life is like. Uh, Verse 8 of chapter 28. They were just told by the angels, do not be afraid, and look what happens. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. You know, so what is that situation? What is that challenge? What is that thing that's going on in your life that kind of gives you a little bit of tension, right? That little bit of adrenaline kind of rush. But with Jesus, you could have joy in the midst of that. And ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They, glass, they clasped his feet and worshipped him, putting Jesus in a very high position. Then Jesus said to them again, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And this is what we celebrate as people of faith here on on Easter Sunday, that Jesus is alive and he is with us in the situation that we're facing 
right now. A theologian called N.T. Wright, he's talking about the resurrection. He says that this event had changed the world forever. It announced, not as a theory, but as a fact, that God's kingdom had come, that the Son of Man had been vindicated after his suffering, and that there was dawning not just another day, not just another week in the history of Israel and the world, but the start of God's new age that would continue until the nations had been brought into obedience. Something big has happened. And that's what on Easter Sunday is why we get so excited about it as resurrection people. The Apostle Paul, one of the leaders in the early church, he wrote in Philippians, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. And sometimes we like to stop quoting that verse right there, right? Just the power of the resurrection. But he goes on, and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. That we have access in our lives to this resurrection power. It is something that as we encounter the risen Christ, it gives us joy in circumstances that would be devastating uh, otherwise. I spoke with Paul last night on the phone for about an hour, and I got off, and we expressed our love uh, to each other, and just so thankful for God's impact and, and touch on our lives. And my question for us here today is, do you know that Jesus? Have you experienced that risen Jesus? And, and if you have, it is truly a, a life-changing experience. We're resurrection people modeling the life of Jesus that we've seen in our candidates who are baptized here this morning. In count, we are uh, resurrection people encountering the risen Jesus, and we are resurrection people sharing the victorious Jesus. Look at verses 9 through 12 in Luke, 20, uh, Luke 24, actually. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and the woman that wasn't listed in the other Gospels. Mary, the, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what had happened? Anybody who's been at Grace Chapel before knows what's going to come up next, right? This painting that I love. It's a painting of, of Peter going to the tomb, wondering what's taking place here. And um, he hears the women saying the tomb is empty, and women at that time weren't considered to be reliable witnesses in courts at all, uh, but he has to go check it out for himself. And I know today we have people from a variety of backgrounds. Some people here who have no understanding of Christianity or very little understanding of Christianity. But I encourage you, check it out. Ask the questions. Is Jesus alive or did he simply just die? Because if he simply just died, we should call it a day, close up shop, and that's it. It's over. But Jesus is alive for us. Jesus is alive. We're resurrection people modeling the life of Jesus, encountering the risen Jesus, sharing the victorious Jesus, and that gives us as an opportunity as God's people to always live out the love and life of Jesus with others. In a verse that's going to be talked about next Sunday, you can come back, I encourage you. We're open every Sunday. It would be great to have you again. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus appears to his disciples and he says these words. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go and make disciples. That's what we are about here at Grace Chapel. We just don't want people to get wet. We want people to go out and live out the love of Jesus in their workplace, in their schools, in their families, and in their communities. We tell the message of Jesus not just with our words, but we tell the message of Jesus with our actions and a life that has been changed. We live as resurrection people in a, in a broken world. So we model the life of Jesus. 
We've encountered uh, the risen Jesus. We're sharing the victorious Jesus. And you're getting the full deal here at Grace Chapel today because in a moment, we're going to be celebrating the ministry of Jesus. And when we come to the communion table, uh, here at Grace Chapel, we celebrate communion every week. We do this, and you can see it's written on the front of the table, this do in remembrance of me. We stop and we remember Jesus' uh, life. We remember his death. And today we celebrate his resurrection because it gives us hope. In, in just a few moments, we're going to be um, passing this out to, to people. And if you're not a Christian today, I, I encourage you to simply pass the tray from, from the left to the right or from the right to the left, however it's come to the next person, and think about this. Because this is serious stuff. Afterwards, when we have our wonderful Indian food meal after the service, you can eat as much as you like, but this is special, right? Um, the, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I passed, also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his, uh, with his disciples. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And this, I have it in bold and in, uh, in yellow on the screen. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember what Jesus has done by participating in this meal. When the trays are passed out, you're going to see the trays. We have wine on the outside and we have juice on the inside because we know some people don't drink alcohol and that's important for them. So you could pick accordingly. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 18 to 19, just a little bit later on, Paul writes these words. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Jesus, we are of all people most to be pitied. Pretty strong words, right? But Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. I'm going to ask this.